live in the new life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we are talking about joy. We said that joy is a force. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47 and 48. It says, Because you have not served the Lord your God with joy and enthusiasm, for the abundant blessings you have received, you will serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you, number one. Then number two, you will be left hungry, thirsty, naked, and lacking in everything. Number three, they will oppress you harshly until you are destroyed. When you reverse verse 48, you get the three functions of joy. Is that not amazing? That means that if you serve God with joy and enthusiasm, He will provide victory for you. That's the first thing. The second thing is that He will provide fulfillment because what it means is that you will not be hungry, you will not be thirsty, and you will not lack in any good thing. When this happens to you, your life will be a fulfilled life. Am I right? Then number three, he will protect you against oppression. Have you seen why many believers are suffering? Because they have not been serving God with joy and enthusiasm. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 29, it says that you are a slave to whatever controls you. People tend to serve whatever they are in bondage to. Whatever overcomes you in life places you in bondage, true or false. Anything that overcomes you, overpowers you, becomes your master. So we need to ask ourselves certain questions this morning. And those questions will help us to assess to what extent that we are in bondage. Bearing in mind that whatever that overpowers us becomes our master and we tend to serve that thing. Multitudes of believers are in trouble today because they fail to realize this simple principle. The first question that we need to ask ourselves, how do I respond when I must suffer through an extended illness? How do you respond to it? The second question, how do I react when the enemy stares up my family or friends to persistently harass and persecute me, how do I react? You know, Jesus Christ said that your worst enemy will come from where? Will come from your household. So how do you react when the enemy stares up members of your family? against you, to harass you, and to persecute you. I know of many people, the very moment you give your life to Christ, they throw you out of the family, they disown you, they do all kinds of things. 
How do you react to that? How do you bear up under lengthy trials as opposed to a brief one? Remember, these questions will help us to assess to what extent we are in bondage. The next question is how am I honestly conducting myself in the midst of the trials which I am experiencing right now? The answers to these questions are very important because if a believer does not respond positively to some of these circumstances that I have mentioned, there is every tendency that he will be derailed completely. So if truly the source of all trial is from Satan, have you seen why multitudes of believers are indirectly and unknowingly serving him? They begin to control our affairs, our attitudes, and our character. So we're going to briefly see God's desire towards his children when they are going through trials. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And 13. He says there, dear friends, don't be surprised at the very trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Verse 13. Instead, be very glad because these trials will make you partners with Jesus Christ in his suffering and afterward you will have the wonderful joy of sharing his glory when it is displayed to all the world. Have you seen it? So in other words, he expects us to count it all joy when we go through trials. Then First Peter chapter 1, let's read verse 6 and 7. First Peter chapter 1 verse 6 and 7. He says there, so be truly glad, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though it is necessary for you to endure many trials for a while. Necessary for you to endure many trials for a while. These trials are only to test your faith. Tell your neighbor the trials are only to test your faith. Trials are not meant to be permanent. They are temporary. It says that these trials are only to test your faith, to show that it is strong and pure. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. And your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. So if your faith remains strong after being tried by fairy trials, it will bring much, much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Jesus Christ has not called his followers to be unstable. It is not his desire that they change during their trials. A lot of people, once there is little trial, you see them, oh, their attitude, the things that they will be vomiting, the things that they will be saying, you begin to wonder whether truly they are Christians. You know, it was joy which gave Jesus Christ the strength to overcome and not to serve the enemy. 
That same joy God has made it available for us. And one of the ways that we assess that joy is by doing what? Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. Can we quickly go to Hebrews chapter 12 to verse 1? He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Who has set this race before us? The word endurance also means patience. So what he's saying, let us run with patience. The race that God has set before us. We do this, verse 2, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. He says he was willing to die a shameful death on the cross, because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Now he is seated in the place of highest honor besides God's throne in heaven. Is that in your Bible? Jesus was able to endure the suffering and the shame of the cross because of the joy that was set before him. So for you to be an overcomer, you must cultivate the attitude of looking unto Jesus. You must acknowledge the fact that he is the author and the finisher and the perfecter of your faith. The second function of the fruit of joy, remember we mentioned three functions. The first, we said that joy produces victory. The second, we said that it provides fulfillment. And the third, we said it protects against oppression, as we saw in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 48. So we're going to briefly look at the second function of the fruit of joy. Let's go to James chapter 1. I'll begin to read from verse 2. It says that, dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. <laughs> Some of you will not like this. Whenever trouble comes your way, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that behind every trouble is hidden opportunity for joy. That means that at the end of it all, that trouble will produce joy. He said, let it be an opportunity. The word let there is the command. It's not a suggestion for a child of God. He said, let it be an opportunity. Let it. Allow it. In other words, what God is saying is that count it all joy. Once there is any trouble, oh, smile. Say, this is the time for me to breastfeed you. That means as a child of God, you don't shy away from troubles or responsibilities. I see many young men shy away from responsibility. They don't like taking up challenges. They see every challenge as a big trouble, as a big deal. But the reverse is the case. Because God is saying that every challenge, every trial, every trouble will produce joy. We just went through 
such challenge for the past almost uh, 10 years plus we had a terrible affliction from our neighbor but through the force of endurance and patience God at his own appointed time took care of the problem and by this last week Friday everything that related to that issue was resolved and taken care of but we had to endure for 10 years plus 10 solid years plus and we were not just enduring because we could not do otherwise we had choices but those choices were not godly choices so we chose to endure to be patient waiting upon God for him to do what only he can handle and he did it he brought great joy to us so he says there whenever trouble comes your way let it be an opportunity for joy for when your faith is tested your endurance has a chance to grow and i said endurance means patience when your patience is tested it has the opportunity to grow it is trials that helps you to develop patience the fruit of patience is developed through what trials that's why god said count it all joy let it be an opportunity know that this trial is going to give me the opportunity to develop and nurture and cultivate the fruit of patience a lot of us are impatient and impatience is a sign of unloveliness when you love you must be patient because nobody is perfect so when you find yourself in situations where you're grossly impatient just know that you need to develop that fruit and I see God in months and weeks ahead bringing such opportunities to us we need a lot of patience especially in our family most divorce cases they are as a result of impatience if only we will be patient with one another if only we will be kind with one another if only we will be gentle with one another if only we will be faithful with one another it's so sad when you find out that the rate of divorce in Christendom is as high as 60 percent when actually it's supposed to be a one-digit issue it's not supposed to be even up to five percent if only we had cultivated the fruit of the spirit and do you realize that many premature death is as a result of the pressure and tension in our families many men die before their time because of pressure at home so women you take it easy learn to be patient with your husband you subject him to so much pressure he will pack up and when he packs up oh like my cousin will say if we get to eliza that's when you know that kaki is not leather you now begin to go through those challenges that you were not patient you thought he was dull he's not acting quickly you begin to see crocro and then weeping will endure in the night you know the worst thing is for you to be going through things that you cannot share with people 
which you are an architect of. We got to develop the fruit of patience with one another. We need to do that. At no other time do we need it in our homes than now. Why? Because there are so much challenges that families are going through. Financial, spiritual, you name it, that we are going through. So if we are not patient with one another, we will miss it. We will say things that we cannot recall back again. You know, when you speak words, you can't take them back. And you know, spoken words are containers of power that could destroy or make. So we got to be patient with one another. We got to be patient with one another. It is very, very important. We need to cultivate that fruit. So he says there in verse 3, For when your faith is tested, your endurance, which is your patience, has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. I can take out three promises from that scripture, James chapter 1, verse 4. For those that endure trials, there are three promises there. Number one is that you will have the opportunity of being perfect. Those that endure trials, number one, they will be perfect. Number two, they will be entire. That means that they will be strong in character. Being ready for anything, that means that there is nothing the enemy will throw at you that you will not be able to handle. Is it? What confidence, I'm telling you. When you develop the force of patience, there is nothing you cannot stand against. No matter what it is, you know it's just a matter of time that everything is going to be good. Because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'm going to make everything beautiful in your life. He said, no matter what the situation is, I'm going to turn it around for your good. The only condition is that you set your love and affection upon him. That's it. So what's the big deal in that that we cannot handle? The third is that they will want nothing. That means they are not going to lack anything. So you see that we can actually reach a place in our lives where we can honestly and continually say with David, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, too many times we we'll recite that scripture, but we don't know the meaning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can only get to that point that you lack nothing when you must have developed and cultivated the fruit of patience. And patience can only be nurtured through trials. And that's why God said, count it all joy. In Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, he says there that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Do you know what happens? If the devil wants to keep your goods, he will steal your joy. Before the devil will destroy any person, the first thing he does is to steal your joy. Because when he succeeds in stealing your joy, he takes that ability of your being an overcomer. Then he will come and destroy and kill. That's why Jesus Christ said, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But for him to do that, 
the first thing he does is to steal your joy. Notice, he will send a family member to come and say something unwholesome about you or challenge you in a way you least expected it. Then you get upset. The very moment you get upset, as it were, you know what you're doing? You're opening the door. You're pulling down your defense. And we are told that when you pull down the hedge, the serpent will strike. So for the enemy to get you, the first thing he does is to upset you. And for him to really upset you, he will get somebody that is close to you, a member of your family. Because he knows that if he uses your enemy, you wouldn't be bothered. So he uses someone that is close to you to upset you. As soon as you get upset, he has stolen your joy. You see the first thing he does? He steals your joy. So when he steals your joy, he will strike. He will destroy and he will kill. So what God is saying this morning is that every age-long burden that he has lifted it for his children. That's one thing about this year 2020. And every yoke that his children are bound to he has broken it. Not going to, he has already done it. Are you guys hearing me? To the extent that even in our land, that burden of wickedness in our leadership, God has also lifted it. The burden of corruption that is destroying the very fabrics of our nation. God had also lifted it. The yoke of bondage and oppression and injustice in our land, God had destroyed it. And you are going to see it because he had already made their weapons useless in their hands. He had already made their way slippery with his angels pursuing them. There is confusion in the enemy's camp. They are going to, not going to, they are already drawing their swords against their own souls. Of course, you know they don't use swords these days. All their armory, they are going to channel it to themselves and destroy one another. It's already happening. We all stand. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Park, Ladoke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.